I'm uh, Rich Reif Snyder. I'm the uh, chair of the uh, Historical Society of the Salisbury uh, Association. And I would like to welcome you to this uh, talk, which is co-sponsored both by the Scoville Memorial Library and by the Historical Society of the Salisbury Association. And certainly we're grateful to the library for hosting this technology because I don't know how to do it. And Karen does. <laughs> So anyway, we're delighted that you're here. Our speaker today, of course, as you know, is Dick Paddock, a retired IBM engineer and a local historian of uh, some renown. He'll be speaking on Salisbury's iron industry and its impact on Salisbury. Dick has not only uh, studied uh, this topic uh, extensively, but at least for me, he has a way of making the industrial processes of iron making uh, intelligible to someone like me, a, a non-engineer. Um, I know that he has honed these skills as president of uh, the Friends of Beckley Furnace in Canaan, uh, which I know you'll want to visit if you haven't already visited after his, uh, after his talk. This is a big day for the Salisbury Association because we are also opening this afternoon a new exhibit in the Academy building on affordable or workplace uh, housing efforts in Salisbury. And this is certainly a timely exhibit as uh, the Salisbury Forum has recently had a program on this topic and you've seen other, uh, other information about what's happening locally uh, in the local paper. So there's much in the news. So following Dick's talk, we'd invite you, if you'd like to, to wend your way to the Academy building and join us for a reception. You can get some goodies there as well as uh, take a, a first glance at, at that exhibit. So anyway, with no further ado, let me uh, again, uh, let us uh, welcome Dick and thank you very much for leading us in this conversation today, Dick. Thanks, Rich. And hi to everybody here in the room in the library and hello to everybody out there in uh, technology land, wherever you may be. I, uh, one of the great advantages of this technology is not only can we have a nice uh, discussion here in the room, but people who are at a distance too great to travel to Salisbury have an opportunity. And as you, you may have overheard at the beginning, we're recording this. Um, so what the fee of the recording will be, I don't know, but I assume it will be available so that you can have friends and relatives view this at a later date. So we're going to get started with that, and, and the topic for this afternoon is iron and particularly its role in the formation and development of Salisbury. Uh, the iron industry itself in the northwest corner is a much larger topic. I have done a, a, a Taconic Learning Center course on the industrial history of the northwest corner, and, and that takes six weeks. Uh, so that's not going to happen to you today. I, I would not do that to you. Uh, but I've made some uh, simplifications in terms of what I'm going to talk about today to kind of focus it on Salisbury. This talk is a derivative one I gave out in Norfolk earlier this year as a way of helping out the publicity for the uh, Great Mountain Forest's development of their charcoal exhibit. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But because I'm back in the hometown here, I've added in a few slides that would not have been interesting to the folks in Norfolk, and we're going to include those here. So to start the story out, you have to set the stage, and this slide does that. This shows you how that at one time, uh, this part of the planet had offshore a nice uh, ocean with some limestone on the bottom minding its own business when uh, another plate on the surface of the earth collided with North America, shoved some of the plate down as you see in the middle frame, and then flipped everything topsy-turvy, putting all of the old rocks on top of the new rocks here in the Salisbury area. Now, this orogeny, the Taconic orogeny, is, is actually quite local. Those of you who've done hiking in the area, if you've, if you've hiked on Bear Mountain or Mount Raiga, you are walking on Wallumzak Schist, which is the leftmost portion of the slide here. If you live in Taconic like I do, which is less than a mile airline from the, the peak of Bear Mountain, uh, my house rests on Stockbridge Marble, which is what happened to the limestone on the bottom of that ocean. When the plates collided, that limestone was metamorphosed into marble. And so even though we call the, the white rock that we have here limestone, it really is Stockbridge Marble. 
it has been changed uh, into a finely crystallized material. It's exactly the same mineral as limestone, but it's a different form. And those of you, some of you are old enough to take earth science here. I don't think they do that anymore, but some of you are. Metamorphic, right? And sedimentary. So limestone is sedimentary, forms at the bottom of the ocean. Metamorphic has been changed in this case by the taconic orogeny. And in between the two layers here, and you're gonna see this graphically in, in a moment, between the Stockbridge marble and the Wallamazak schist, what do we have but a layer of iron? just where we need it to be. And that's all a result of this uh, geologic event. So several million years ago, nature sets the stage for Salisbury's iron industry by providing marble and iron right in adjacent locations to one another. <coughs> in terms of what that meant to Salisbury is it drove the settlement of this area. Uh, I don't have to tell you folks that live here that Salisbury is a hilly, rocky area. You do not come here because of the abundant farmland. <laughs> because what little there is is along the Housatonic River, and even that had rocks in it. You, you didn't come here in the 1700s to recreate on the lakes, first of all, because there was nowhere to do that. And second of all, people in the 18th century didn't have much leisure time. So you didn't come here for that. But all these hills and lakes, waterways, provide energy water power. So there's an attraction. And then the iron ore deposits sort of sealed the deal. There were numerous mines, but despite that fact, let's look at a little history here. This is just a, a simple slide of how Connecticut was settled. And you'll notice that, of course, Windsor is the first settlement where uh, the group comes over from Providence to settle there. Uh, but look at the dates on this slide. Where does Connecticut develop? It develops along the rivers that are navigable, which does not include the Housatonic. It is in no sense of the word navigable. Uh, the Connecticut River is, the Thames River is, and there's where your settlements occur. You, you have coastal settlements along the Sound in the 1630s, and look at what happens up here where we are. We don't see settlement occurring for about a century later. And that's because it's hard to get here on the surface. Mm -hmm. If the Housatonic was navigable, maybe, but it isn't. So you didn't paddle your canoe up from the Sound. You had to go overland to get here. And that remained a problem through the entire 19th century. So people get here late, but why they get here, the reason comes to light in 1728 when iron ore is discovered here in Salisbury at Ore Hill. Uh, initially by some local surveyors, uh, the find was confirmed. The first grant came in the same year and the, it became clear to the, the uh, leaders in the Connecticut colony, this, this resource was contended. There was a little contention for this iron ore because we're much closer to the Hudson River than we are to the Connecticut River. And so the colony of New York could get here to these resources. And indeed there are adjacent resources in the, on the New York side of the border. There is also some iron ore over there. And the Livingstons who own the most of the bulk of the, what's now uh, uh, Duchess and Columbia County had their eye on this kind of resource. Uh, they built their own iron works uh, and that's a topic for another day, but in New York. And so there was some amount of concern in the Connecticut colony that the New Yorkers might try to get this resource and get, get control of it. So that established a, a motivation to settle this area and firmly nail it down as part of Connecticut. And accordingly, uh, Salisbury were surveyed, uh, lots were sold, and the town was incorporated in 1741. So that starts the story. Uh, and, you know, it's it's hard to be sure that how much of a motivation the iron really was, but it does seem to me that it galvanized that decision to, to settle this area. Now, how do you find iron ore? You literally trip over it. And uh, <laughs> this piece, I, I believe, I can't really be sure, this piece is probably at the old transfer station, so you won't be tripping over this one. Mm -hmm. However, I'll give you a homework assignment. There's two more of these in town in public areas that you can try to find. So, and I used to be mean and not even give you a hint, but think Town Grove, 
<laughs> and, and think the first light parking area above the Great Falls. And if you poke around enough at those two sites, you're going to trip over some iron ore, just like this piece. And, and that's how it's discovered. You trip over it. It doesn't look like much, but, but if you're a geologist and you see this, you'd say, oh, iron, yes. Now, mining began at Ore Hill. Now, I, I'll just make sure everybody knows where Ore Hill is. It's at the intersection of Route 112 and 44 in Lakeville, but the trick is it's not a hill anymore. It's a hole in the ground because we dug all the iron out. And so now it's a, it's a pond. But if you've even casually looked at that body of water, you say, gee, you know, the sides of that thing are awful steep. And they are. The, the boundaries, the, the shoreline, if you will, of Ore Hill goes straight down to 150 feet. There's no beach, there's no, there's no way to walk out of that. If you fall into that thing, you it's straight to the bottom. There, there's, there's no way to walk out of it. You have to be dragged out. So don't go swimming in Oreo. Uh, but uh, it's not the only one, but that was where it was discovered. Yes, it originally was a hill. It's now uh, at least a 250 foot deep hole it may have been as deep as, as 800 feet. We're not really sure about that, but there are also tunnels that go out for probably for miles from the bottom of that pit. In 1904, a map was done of the tunnels as they existed at that time. And we put that on a sign panel. The Salisbury Association Historical Society worked up a sign panel at Ore Hill. You can pull over and look at that sign panel. And one of the uh, uh, pieces of information on there is that 1904 map. And there's actually two map insets. One gives you kind of a, a horizontal cut and the other is a vertical cut. And in, it, uh, I'll ruin the surprise. It looks like spaghetti on a plate. <laughs> and it, it's hard to believe that all that is under your feet when you're standing there looking at that sign. The other thing that's on the panel that's worth stopping and taking a minute to look at uh, is a picture of the mine without it full of water. What, it, what, how deep a hole it is, the fact that the railroad once crossed it, it gives you some idea of how much iron ore came out of that. It, it's a very large mine, and the speculation is that only a small fraction of the iron has actually been removed. <laughs> um, so that was where it all began. But there are a lot more iron mines in Salisbury. And as you can see here, uh, they tend to follow Route 41. But uh, we started Ore Hill at 112 intersection with 44. Just down the road uh, is another mine called Deep Lake, the Chatfield ore bed. And it's the same thing. It's a very steeply banked mine hole in the ground where they dug along the, the ore. If you go on up uh, Route 41, you hit the Porter Ore Bed, which is uh, is behind the bank building now on the uh, rear prop where Lakeville Journal used to be. The Davis Mine is behind the Iron Master's Lodge. And then you go on further up, the Scoville Ore Bed is off Route 41. And the Homestead Mine on Route 41 is actually two. There's two entrances. They're called adits. They are, they are tunnel entrances that go back into the mountain. They're not very big pits but they are ramps that lead to tunnels and we have no maps of those. So I have no idea how extensive the homestead diggings are. And the most interesting one for me, because I live on Twin Lakes is the uh, Frink mine, which abuts the boathouse at Salisbury School. There, if you notice there's a little inlet on the lake there. Well, that's an iron mine. And the school has recently filled in a lot of that, but uh, so there's one iron mine right on Twin Lakes. And all of the Twin Lakes Taconic area is is on marble. So this is the this is this is where the action's at, right in this part of town. The uh, seam between the Stockbridge marble, the Walmsack schist, with the accompanying sandwich of iron, goes on the, all the way up past Lanesboro, uh, Massachusetts, and it goes down as far as Manapac, New York. It doesn't quite line up with the state lines. But there's an enormous amount of iron that's still in the ground along that uh, tectonic boundary. Okay. If you're going to make iron, you need fuel. And charcoal is what you use in Northwest Connecticut because we don't have any coal. And we didn't have any way to get coal until the middle of the 19th century. Uh, you make charcoal from trees. 
uh, one acre forest. This is, this is an interesting formula. Uh, you'll want to keep this in mind. Uh, if you read down to the bottom through all the lines, you see that one furnace consumes about 500 acres of forest a year. Now, the nice thing about uh, forests, so first of all, it's not a fossil fuel. Unfortunately, it produces lots and lots of carbon dioxide. That's not so great. But it's every bit the renewable fuel source because trees grow back and our ancestors knew that. And so they purchased, the iron companies purchased large tracts of land and cut them on a 20 year rotation. And you can see here that 10,000 acres is enough to provide you a perennial unending supply of fuel for your furnace. And so large tracts of land were uh, acquired by the iron companies specifically for this purpose. And land that was used to grow trees for charcoal was called charcoal bush. And so we have a lot of charcoal bush land and we'll talk about that later in our area. Here's what a charcoal hearth looks like. Uh, this is from a series of drawings done by Sharon resident James Callard Smith in the 1930s, and they are absolutely fabulous drawings. The only problem with them is they're pencil drawings, so I made sure I got these scanned so we didn't have to pass them around and smudge them up, but they're beautiful drawings. This is a schematic of a charcoal hearth. The, the target wood size is eight inch, uh, an eight inch log, and you can see how they're stacked here. Not so clear is in the center of this is a thing called the pulpit, which is like a little chimney, and that's where you start the fire. And you can also see that uh, we're covering over the side of the side of this thing with uh, dirt and wet leaves because we want to control the amount of air that can get to this. Now, something we all know intuitively, but these guys knew for sure, was that carbon burns at a uh, higher temperature than other materials in the wood which is why at the end of your fire, what have you got? Coals, carbon, because they're the last to be consumed by the fire. All the tars and other things burn up more quickly. These guys knew that, and they knew that by controlling the amount of air that got into this thing, they could burn out the turpentine, alcohol, wood tar, all of the other materials that, that burn at a lower temperature and be left with just the coal, the charcoal, the carbon. And you've got to be good at this. You, you pay attention to the color of the smoke and, and other things. To do this, the, uh, the National Park Service was, up until COVID at least, doing one of these down in Hopewell, uh, Pennsylvania, every year. And I went. And you wouldn't think watching charcoal burn is very interesting. <laughs> and it isn't. But you do get something from the experience of seeing a pile of dirt that all of a sudden feels really, really warm. Because what, what you see when you go to one of these is a pile of dirt and some smoldering. And the closer you get to this, you realize it's 1,700 degrees in there. And boy, do you feel that when you walk up one of these. I've got my fingers crossed that the folks at Great Mountain Forest are going to do this one of these years. So you may get to experience it. In any event, here is what the thing really looks like. This is a picture from a postcard taken. And it's essentially, I love this picture because it's essentially the same as a drawing. These guys have got their pile built. They, they're partially covering it over with dirt. And you notice that they've used smaller pieces of wood to kind of seal up the openings in the periphery of the pile here to help control that. And what they will do is they will scoop out small holes around the periphery of the, the pile, and they'll move those holes. Takes about two weeks for one of these to smolder down and, and give you your crop of charcoal. It was an extremely popular occupation in this part of the United States during the ironwork in this area. And it was very much an equal opportunity uh, occupation, as we'll see. Uh, oops. I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> we're, we're getting an interesting poem from the computer. There we go. Excuse me for a second. Yeah. This is a one of my favorite pictures. We we love to use this picture with school groups at Beckley. It comes from an eight by ten glass plate photograph. Mm -hmm. The original source I'm told was Goshen, but I got it from the Norfolk Historical Society, and they had a very nice scan of it. These are the people who made America, folks. Mm -hmm. These are the colliers that made the coal, that made the iron, that made all the other stuff. So uh, these, this is what the people who built America look like. 
you know, some of the things you'll notice here that the girls clearly have uh, clothing that's been made from the same bolt of cloth. Uh, you know, there's two families here and there's only one, one kid that's smiling. <laughs> and we kind of wonder about him because <laughs> Ed Kirby and I had a standing um, uh, uh, joke about is his finger in dad's glass of liquor or not. <laughs> and and, and we, we never really could des decide. But some of the other, th what's wonderful about this is to hand this to a crowd of kids. Because mm -hmm. first of all, it gives them insight into a lifestyle they can't imagine. And there's also some Easter eggs to find in here. There's there's a dog, a cat, and some chickens that are not apparent, uh, at least from the distance you're at here. But indeed, if you study the uh, the image, you will you will find the chickens are moving, so they're a little blurry. But the cat is stretched out like a cat, and and the dog is sort of watching over all this, like what's going on. But it's a wonderful view, and this is the kind of a building they would have lived in because it was not permanent. They were going to move on. So this is what the people look like who did this. All right, making the iron, the first production was via bloomery. We're going to discuss that in a minute. Uh, the first one here in Salisbury is built on Salmon Kill Road, and we have a nice sign panel there, but it's at the bridge that's being rebuilt, so you can't visit it right now. Uh, the hallmark of a bloomery is that the iron is not liquefied. It is only softened, and so you can't do things like make cast iron. From a bloomer, but you can make end product. You can make chains and rods and nails and springs and all kinds of other stuff that doesn't require you to melt the iron to liquid state. Uh, nail rods, and we're going to talk about nail rods in a minute. And merchant bars. A merchant bar was a standard size bar of iron, and blacksmiths would purchase those, and then they could turn those into horseshoes and gate iron and hinges and whatever else. So. The blacksmiths would purchase the merchant bars as raw and nail rods as more raw material. Here in the northwest corner, 1762, it is the first blast furnace, which was in Lakeville, located behind what is now the Fern Restaurant, uh, the old firehouse. Uh, here, the iron is turned into liquid, and now we can talk about castings. We can talk about frying pans and hog kettles and if you want to see a magnificent example of a local cast iron kettle, just go to the Academy building and there it is right at the corner of the building. It's even nice enough to have a, a, a logo cast in it that says when it was made. And look at the size of that thing and realize that to make that, you had to have a ladle with enough iron to pour that in one shot. And you had to have a mold that would hold all that iron. Now, liquid iron's liquid, but it's still iron and it still weighs what iron is. So go look at that kettle sometime and ask yourself, how did they do that? Because they did it routinely. Uh, okay. So we've got our blast furnace now in 1762. This is what a bloomery looks like. It's it's probably a 12 foot tall chimney. Uh, the bloomeries in this area were run by weather bellows. And you've noticed I've, I've signified a thing called a bloom. I call them goo balls. Think of a sticky, gooey ball of red hot, white hot iron. And the way you get the slag and other impurities out of a bloom is you lift it out of there. So right away, we're going to have a, a limit on how big that can be because a couple of people have to be able to lift it out of the furnace. And you put it on an anvil and you beat it. And it's a classic picture. The more you hit it, the more sparks fly out, which is all the impurities. And and as soon as it cools off, you put it back in here and you do this over and over again. Mm -hmm. So this is a labor intensive process, but it works quite well. <laughs> this is a blast furnace and, and this is another drawing by James Calvert Smith. Mm -hmm. This one is a very good representation of the furnace stack that remains on Mount Raga. That's a cold blast furnace. It has this kind of vase-shaped interior. The, the shape of the interior is no accident. This thing is contrived so that uh, the widest part of the uh, vase here is called the Bosch. And that's where all the magic happens that turns the iron ore back into iron. And you want that big volume area there because you want the most intensive fire there. Uh, but you also want to consume all the oxygen coming in in the blast because you want carbon monoxide gas to do the deed of turning the iron ore back into iron. So that shape is not at all accidental. 
And it took a long time for these artisans to figure out what the dimensions of this shape was. So that, that there's a lot of uh, experience into designing and constructing one of these furnaces. You'll notice it's got uh, an abbreviated chimney on the top. The ingredients were loaded through the trap door straight up. And the this is an accurate depiction of that because you would you would load layers. Each layer of charge, as it was called, or burden, was a layer of charcoal and, and followed by a layer of Stockbridge marble and iron ore. And the marble plays a, a role here in separating the impurities from the iron. So that's what the marble's all about. And that's why you've got to have it. Um, even the modern day industry uses calcium carbonate as part of the smelting process. So that again, plays back into the geology where nature gave us exactly the two things we needed. All right, we, we needed the, the marble for the calcium carbonate and we need the iron and the rest was trees. We got it all. But with, without that uh, marble and iron, we're at a disadvantage. Other iron works in the state of Connecticut, there is other places where you can find iron. Stafford Springs is one, but there is also some along the shore, but they don't have any marble in Stafford Springs and they don't have any marble along the shore. What they did was they used the uh, Indian uh, shell middens. They used oyster shells and clam shells, which are not a good substitute for limestone. They're calcium carbonate, but they're not a good substitute. So inferior iron resulted. We had what you really needed to use here. The interesting thing about this, at this stage, this is a cold blast furnace. The air coming in is at uh, just environmental temperature. And a lot of carbon monoxide gas goes up that tunnel head. And carbon monoxide, you know, first of all, it's toxic and our, our ancestors knew that. And it's also flammable. So what they would do is they would light that off. You can see there's a little cap on, they'd open that cap and they'd ignite that waste gas and flare it off. And so a furnace like the one on Mount Riga was the hallmark. Remember, these things run 24-7. It's not an air or a day. There would be a beacon up on Mount Riga burning all night. And back then, when there were less trees, I'm sure you could see that beacon from Sharon easily. So these cold blast furnaces, which were the first ones built, were accompanied by these flares. And so they were easy to find. Okay. What was the big deal about iron? You don't, you know, it's not gold, it's not silver. Uh, however, if you're a European <laughs> recently arrived in North America, this is some of the inventory of things you need in order to live. And uh, mill irons in particular, mill, mill irons, not so much plows, you can make plows out of wood, but a mill iron is, is the metal work required to support the millstones in a grist mill. Mm -hmm. So if you like bread, you need iron too, in order to build your grist mill nails and screws to assemble houses and wagons, and finally tack and draft irons because oxen and horses are, are your energy source and you need the ancillary equipment to harness them up and utilize them. Iron has uh, an unfortunate property in that the permissive cost of all this kind of stuff, you, you can't charge an arm and a leg, especially to colonists freshly arrived, and iron is heavy. Boy, is it heavy. So shipping all this good stuff over here from England is just going to add to the cost. And there's a processing cost and a manufacturing cost of the goods in England, and then you've got to put them on a ship and get them over here, which is only going to drive the cost up. So there's an enormous motivation here to make the stuff locally, where we can cart it around ourselves uh, and avoid some of the costs involved in, in getting these goods. The king wasn't really thrilled with that idea. He <laughs> he kind of liked the other way around, but there's just no way you're gonna you're gonna make that model of finished goods from England work. So this is a, a look at one humble thing called you know the nails, uh, kind of something you don't really think about. Uh, this was a, a serious uh, product made here in in mostly in Canaan, but some in Salisbury as well. And the story goes, I love this story, I hope it's true, that the local farmers would buy nail rods and they would give them to their teenage sons to bang nails out, which got rid of all their extra energy <laughs> and perhaps reduced the level of mischief they got into. Uh, there's a story in there, you can see there's a thing up here called a rose flat nail. There's a story in one of the uh, books we've read that says a, a good blacksmith could make a rose nail in five hits. 
<laughs> on his anvil. And there was a swig, but some of the rest of these, like horseshoes and and cut nails, like where you cut them out of a strip, are, are don't even take five hits. And so I, I think you can well imagine, I, or maybe it's not a teenager, but somebody sitting there banging these out is kind of a, a way to earn a little extra money. Until uh, the Shakers invented a machine to do this. And uh, the the story goes that it was a woman at the Hancock Shaker Village that invented a nail machine that kind of put an end to this by hand. And I like that story, so I hope it's true. Uh, just like the, the circular saw was supposedly also have been invented by a woman at Oneida. And I hope that's true, too. Uh, it shows what happens when you use brain power. <laughs> okay, supplying the revolution. The next step comes when the revolution breaks out. The governor of Connecticut thinks, hmm, I've got this furnace up there. He sends Joshua Porter up here to take a look at it. The colony takes control of the furnace, and we made more than 850 guns here. Uh, and we think we have one in captivity in the academy building. Uh, so one of the problems with the guns made here in Salisbury for Washington's army is they have no identifying marks. And, and the reason behind that was at least one of the motivations for that was they did not want the British to know where they were coming from. Mm -hmm. And there is no Battle of Salisbury, so the British never found us. There's a battle of Danbury and some other that they did find some of the other uh, resources that the colonists had and destroyed them. They burned Kingston. Uh, so uh, but there's no battle of Salisbury. They didn't find us. Uh, and we kept making the guns. We made uh, swivel guns, which is a little thing on a, on a, like an oarlock that you can use on a boat. And 18 pounds, 18 pounds of they, the, the caliber of the guns was was stated in the weight of the projectile. Not a particularly good measure, but that's how they did that. The largest of the guns weighed two tons, so these are heavy objects. The other problem, and of course here we made shot cannonballs, grenades, and all the other good stuff that goes with a revolution. And Salisbury did supply the arms for the Constitution, although those came into play a little bit later. Uh, we did not make the links for the chain. There, there's a persistent story that the links for the Hudson River chain were made in Salisbury. Sorry, they, they were made in New Jersey. But it's possible that some bars went from Salisbury to the effort. I, mean, I can't rule that out. But we did not make the links. If you'd like to see what the chain across the Hudson looked like, I strongly recommend you visit West Point. Get yourself, ask the gate guard how to get to Trophy Point. It is one of the most beautiful places you will ever encounter anywhere in terms of the scenery at Trophy Point of the north, northern view of the Hudson River Valley. It's just, a, I can't describe it. It's, it's stunning. And there's a monument there where they have some chain links, as well as guns captured from all sorts of battles that the United States Army fought and won. So it's a fascinating place to go, and you can actually see what the chain looked like. Uh, okay, so the guns from here went to Norwich. Uh, and then they were either a, they were set up on carriages, either for use on ships or field, or or in garrison, which would be a fort. And they spread out through the revolution. Uh, we think we have one again because there's no identifying marks. We think we have one at the academy building that that came to us a few years back. Uh, I've been all over that thing because I cleaned it and painted the carriage and whatnot on it, and I'm convinced it is a Salisbury gun for one very important reason. Someone expended an enormous amount of energy trying to destroy that gun. The way you destroy a cannon and deny it to the enemy when you're about to be overrun, the way you destroy a cannon so the enemy can't use it, there's, there's three things you can do to it. First of all, you can drive a nail into the fuse hole. There's a little hole that allows you to light the powder off in the gun. You drive a nail in there. That's called spiking the gun. Ever hear of that? Well, that's, that's what spiking a gun means. You, you drive a nail and break it off. So you can't light the fuse anymore. The other thing you can do is, is a ball-shaped protrusion on the back of the gun called the cascabel. You can break that off because if you do that, the, it weakens the gun to the point where it's likely to fail. So breaking the cascabel off is a, is a good eye strategy. And the gun also has two uh, pins that come out to support the gun on the carriage. 
called trunnions. And if you break a trunnion off, now you can't mount the gun and aim it. So breaking the trunnions off, breaking the cascabel off and or spiking the gun, all three of those strategies were put into play on the gun we have at the academy. It was spiked. Someone really, really, really tried to break off the cascabel and the trunnions and they could not do it. They were able to take little chips. So one of the characteristics of iron made here is it is incredibly difficult to break it. <laughs> and so the fact that someone expended all that energy and failed to destroy the gun we have tells me very likely that's a Salisbury gun because if it had been made in New Jersey or Virginia or any of the other colonial foundries, they would have broken it easily. Not the ones from here. And the spike was repaired. Someone drilled out the nail and put a nice little bronze sleeve in there. So this gun was put back into service mm -hmm. after someone tried to destroy it. So next time you're in the academy building, look that thing over and notice the trunnions and the cascabel and see if you agree with me. Uh, now, this is pretty, did you know we had a steel mill in Colebrook? I didn't until I started getting into this, but there was a steel mill in all places, Colebrook, and they made the drill bits. This is a classic uh, drawing. I believe uh, someone here probably knows. I think this was done for the Reader's Digest mm -hmm. originally in our, it, it's a wonderful drawing. We've used, we have permission to use it and boy, we've taken advantage of that. <laughs> uh, in, the building up in the background with all the windows in it is the Farnham Tavern and it still exists. It's still there. So that gives you an idea of where this occurred. You can see that the moles, which are sitting in the foreground, were put in the ground in a hole so that you could put sand in to remember, what I told you about liquid iron. It's liquid, but it's iron and it's heavy and it's gonna push the moles open. So you put them in the ground and bury them and now the weight of the dirt's gonna hold the moles together while the iron cures. The guns come out, as you can see, the raw castings are, are laying there and they have, we have a little house <laughs> where we hang the, the gun vertically and use gravity to push it down on the drill bit and drill it out. Now, that's a pretty good process, but it doesn't always lead to a perfectly straight bore in the gun. So after that is completed and the bore is put in it, you got to test fire the gun to see if it shoots right or left. And the arms maker here in Lakeville will put, if there's correction that he has to apply, he will put marks on the barrel with, with a, a stamp to indicate to the gunner whether this one shoots right, shoots left, or shoots true. And the the way they did that was they uh, they did several test firings. One was what they call point blank, which is when you level the you level a gun and you shoot it straight. And the other one is a range test, which since this was done, you can see roughly where this was in Lakeville. They fired at Lakeview Avenue across the road here. <laughs> and indeed, when Lakeview Avenue was constructed, the number of cannonballs were on earth when those foundations were dug. So quite a few of them. Uh, two other proofing places in Northwest Connecticut are Dublin Road and uh, Falls Village. And the uh, lake in Sharon is full of shells from the Hotchkiss Brothers. So <laughs> there are other proving grounds, but ours in Salisbury was like you have. Okay, let's get after the revolution. The, the guy who owned the furnace in, in the outbreak of hostilities was a guy named Richard Smith who somehow found it necessary to be in Europe during the entire revolution. <laughs> uh, one story is his wife went to Paris to have her hair done. I don't know about that one. But, uh, in any event, he, he couldn't be here for the, the entire duration. But And there was suspicion he was a Tory, but it was never proven. And when he returned after the war, he came back and the state legislature returned the ownership of the furnace to him. He didn't keep it very long. He, he sold out almost immediately. And the next step in the chain of note was uh, the purchase of the Lakeville Furnace in 1799 by the Holly family, Luther Holly. Uh, and the Holly family ran that until uh, 1828. The furnace was finally torn down, the Lakeville Furnace, in uh, 1843. And uh, if you're familiar with Lakeville, you know what they did. They built the Holly Knife Factory right on top of that site. So the, which still exists. Uh, 
So here's a little bit of the story of the Lakeville furnace and, and the fact that it did last uh, in use until 1828 when the focus of the industry shifted geographically to other parts of the area. All right, the Holly family are all descendants of Joshua Porter. Remember, he was the guy sent up here to evaluate the furnace uh, for use during the revolution. They were politically active. Uh, Lieutenant Governor and Governor Alexander Holly. And then there's Alexander L. Holly, who was hired to bring the Bessemer process to the United States. And he did that. And, and it's kind of an industrial espionage thing. The British developed this and, and we wanted it. And we sent a guy with a really good memory and a really good ability to sketch what he'd seen over to uh, detail the process and bring it back. And he did, but he did not bring it to Salisbury. And we're, there's a lot of us who wonder if that was deliberate. Now, he was hired by the Troy Ironworks to bring it to them up in Troy, New York. So maybe that's all it was. But maybe he really didn't want to see Salisbury turn into Pittsburgh. Uh, I don't know. It's hard, it's hard to know what his motivation was. But in any event, the Bessemer process did not come here. And that probably changed the course of the history of the town. All right. And of course, you know then what the Hollies did after they built the knife factory, which continued in the 20th century. Uh, they also uh, left us the Holly Williams house, which while it's now in, in private hands and, and, and very responsible private hands, uh, it was a source of many historic artifacts. We still have things in storage that came from there and an enormous amount of family history. And the Hollywood Mansion is also another legacy of the family. There's a wonderful story in the oral history. I have no idea if it's true that Hollywood in California was named from this Hollywood Mansion. And wouldn't that be cool if it was real? <laughs> I don't know. There, there's a plausible story. I think Gene would probably know. I think that story is in uh, Mrs. Singleton Fish's uh, oral history. So if you if you want to get the, the deal on the Hollywood, Hollywood connection, go look for her oral history. Uh, now, Horatio Ames, this is this is a great story. Horatio is a huge guy. He's he's he's, he's a, a football linebacker kind of guy. Uh, he's the son of uh, another industrialist by the same name of Ames. And these guys make shovels. Doesn't sound really exciting, does it? Although if you go to the hardware store, you can still buy an Ames shovel. So, but what happens to them, uh, they have their work is up near uh, Amesbury, Massachusetts. Isn't that interesting? And we have an Amesville here in, in Salisbury. And yeah, uh, Horatio is responsible for that. Uh, but the big deal comes in 1849, the gold rush and the Ames guys. What do you need if you're going to go prospecting shovels and picks and they're right there? Mm -hmm. So boy, did they clean up from that. But that's in the future. Uh, Horatio comes here in the uh, early 1840s. He makes cannon, locomotive tires, and steamship cranks. And here in Salisbury is the largest steam hammer in, in the United States and probably this hemisphere in this period. So we have one of the heaviest possible industries right here in Salisbury in the 1840s. Crazy, huh? <laughs> uh, by the way, locomotive tires. Does everybody know what a locomotive tire is? Locomotives have tires? And, and yes, they do. And they have to be changed periodically because they wear from going around corners. And they are essentially iron rings that are shrunk onto the cast iron driver wheel. And when these things were replaced, a lot of times the local fire companies took them and hung them up and made bells out of them. If you want to see a locomotive tire, go to the Canaan Fire Company. There's one hanging over there. And, and keep your eyes peeled. A lot of volunteer fire companies in this area have locomotive tires somewhere on the premises hanging out as, as souvenirs. They, they don't make the greatest bells in the world, but some of them do. But I'll guarantee there's one for sure in Canaan that you can see. That's what the Ames Works looks like. This was located at the parking lot, First Lights parking lot at the top of the falls, which is today wilderness. If you went on Lubu Cherry's walk, you, you went through the woods on this piece of land. And this ain't the whole story. Before this was there, there was a paper mill there. Uh, after this was there, there was an extensive uh, works for the Housatonic Railroad, which is a story for another day. 
but there was an enormous industrial plant that replaced this one to make locomotives, freight cars, and other things for the railroad. So this piece of ground in Salisbury is probably one of the most heavily industrialized acres you'll find anywhere in the world. And you go there now, <laughs> and you're looking at trees and shrubs. <laughs> you won't even find a brick. I don't know, is Lou here? Yes. Can you find a brick over there, Lou? When the foliage is clear, you can see the remnant of the, the back brick wall of the main shop house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to really look. Yeah. You know, so this is all the equipment that Ames had on the site. Uh, we're not even going to go with what the railroad had there. But this was a huge uh, operation with all these uh, puddling furnaces. Puddling is a process of refining. Uh, again, we, we can't take the time to get into what puddling and all these other things are. But I, the point of this uh, slide is to tell you there's a lot of equipment there. Uh, and here is a wonderful uh, picture of forging of a steamship crank yeah. with Thor. Uh, and that's the, the steam hammer Thor. And even here in the 1840s, they had a good enough control over this so they could bring the hammer down and hold an egg upright with it. So this, this is a very precisely controlled machine. You can see there's a large workforce now. The original of this picture comes from a wonderful poster that hangs in the academy building. So if you want to see a lot more, there's a lot of insets in there about other things they did at the Ames work. Get yourself over to the academy building. Uh, maybe you can go there today. Take a look at this picture and you'll have a lot of insight into what went on in the Ames factory. Okay. Change stories. Now comes along Barnum and Richardson, Milo Barnum and Leonard Richardson, who begin business in about 1830. So 1830 and 1840 is the second blossoming of the industry here in Salisbury. And it's really going to take off. We've got, remember, we, we've got Barnum and Richardson, we've got Horatio Ames, we've got the Hollies. So we've got a lot of industry here. Barnum and Richardson make railroad car wheels, cast, cast iron. They developed, they had patents on some of the processes to do that. They took advantage of the fact that Salisbury iron was so incredibly durable. It's, it's a, a real asset to have wheels carrying freight cars that will not crack. Uh, that's an important characteristic. Uh, there's a, a wonderful test that I thought was a, a report of a test done in England on Barn Richards and wheels. They were trying to break into the European market and the British didn't have much use for anything made in America. And they tested a Barnum Richardson wheel by beating it on it with a 32 pound sledgehammer, which is, first of all, something implausible to me. I can't imagine a 32 pound hammer, but much less swinging one. But ultimately, we found in a, an archive in Britain a, a, a written uh, log of the test, and it was indeed a 32 pound hammer. There were two guys. And it took 264 hits before they could damage the wheel. And the only damage they could do was to break the little half moon chip out of the you know, edge of the wheel. And the English wheel was gravel long before that. So this was high quality stuff. You'll notice here this, this one side of the chart says uh, Ensign Manufacturing, Huntington, West Virginia. What's that got to do with Salisbury? Well, look who the president of the. Uh, and some manufacturing it. <laughs> William H. Barnum, and where is he? Right here in Salisbury. Similarly, the Barnum and Richardson Manufacturing Company in Chicago, well, look who runs that. The same William H. Barnum, although we got him in Lime Rock on this half of the, <laughs> the app. Uh, by the way, the Huntington is Collis Huntington, who those of you know your history of California, uh, Huntington plays a, a role later on in the railroad development, but he's a Connecticut guy. And he's he's in with Barnum and he's in with the Ensigns. The Ensigns are from Sharon. So there's a very strong Salisbury, Connecticut connection. And these guys are making wheels. You can the one in West Virginia, this became American Machine and Foundry in, in due course, but uh, they're making wheels for the Southern Railroads. Uh, the one in Chicago is making the, uh, the wheels for the Midwestern Railroads. And here in Lime Rock, we're making them for the Eastern Railroads. So this was a, I, I won't tell you it's the largest maker of railroad car wheels, but it certainly is a significant maker of them. We've offended the digital gods again. Mm -hmm. so, there we go. It's whenever someone decides to pop into the meeting. <laughs> oh, I this is a picture of the loading dock at Lime Rock with the car wheels. 
And they have this beautiful spiral back pattern. We have a couple of the patterns at the Academy building that you can look at if you ask nicely. Uh, so you can see what these things look like. They're 33 inches in diameter and the finished wheel weighs about 660 pounds. So these are large cast objects. They're, they're not simple. They have, you'll notice if you can tell there's, there's holes in there, the parts of these hubs are hollow. They are a complicated casting and BNR has the patents on the molds to produce them. The one thing we did not know about this picture until we got some notebooks donated to the Falls Village Canaan Historical Society about BNR is that there's a practical joke in process in this picture. And it, it's not at all obvious until you hear the backstory. But you'll notice over on the left-hand side, there's a wheel there that does not have a hole in it. All the other wheels have holes in them for the axle. You see that? Mm -hmm. And there's a guy standing there. He's got one up against his knees, but mm -hmm. that one doesn't have a hole in it. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason for that is that's a wooden pattern. Mm -hmm. That weighs about 60 pounds, not mm -hmm. 660. So the, the photographer is the victim in this. Mm -hmm. The photographer trips the shutter, takes his picture, and this little guy over here throws that pattern up on his shoulder and walks back into the tunnel. <laughs> room. And the, the foreman and, and the guy says, did he, did it, did I just see him do that? And he says, well, yeah, I used to do two, but we kind of had it popping out of that. And so we have another picture in the archive that shows him with that up on his shoulder. And uh, in a, a, a previous uh, a presentation, we actually brought one in here and repeated the stunt in front of the audience. So, but it, it's not as dramatic when you don't have the surrounding stock of real, real material here. So this is one case where a picture has come down to us from another time where we've actually got a backstory on what's going on here. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is priceless. Uh, they didn't just make railroad car wheels, and this is the typical multi-font printers. Uh, the printers love to do this, I guess, set all these things in different typesets. But it says castings, patterns, large from the machine shop, all kinds of stuff that Barnum and Richardson made in Lime Rock. Uh, so they were a go-to place for any kind of casting work. Uh, some of the customers, Collins and Company. Those of you who know your Civil War history, remember John Brown and his pikes? Collins and Company made the pikes and they were made from Salisbury iron. And you can go to the museum in Collinsville and you can see some of those pikes. American Locomotive, American Steel and Wire, the US Navy, and Yale and Town. There's a big article in uh, Connecticut, uh, Connecticut history about that. I think this month about Yale and Town, block makers, and then an improbable customer of all, Thomas Edison. And, and we love to do this at the furnace. We have a, a, an ingot of the iron that Edison purchased. He purchased a very particular kind of iron. And it's it's very, it's called white iron. It's very hard. You can't drill it or machine it. You have to grind it or forge it. And, and you figure, what well, really, really hard iron. What's Thomas Edison doing? I'll give you, he's not doing light bulbs with that. I'll tell you for sure. But what is he making that needs some really hard iron? particularly hard iron. He's making a product that needs that. Exactly. <laughs> gold star, phonograph needles. So Edison, the gold Edison Victrola phonograph needles are made from Salisbury. <laughs> and of course, I don't know how many tons of iron you need to make needles. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting use. And there are a lot more of these recorded. Uh, BNR finally goes into receivership in 1916 because of some genuinely boneheaded business decisions that they made with respect to fuel. Uh, there's a reorganiza reorganization of the BNR in 1920 where they attempt to restart the business because there's still a good market for Salisbury iron because of its durability. It's a niche market to be sure because the railroad industry has gone over to cast steel now Again, that's that's a long-term effect of the Bessemer process that made the steel cheaper. So the cast iron car wheels now are either soon to be or have been outlawed. That's not the market anymore, but there are still markets for Salisbury's charcoal iron, but they were not able to make the capital investment needed to build new furnaces and bring them online in East Canaan. They had attempted to build a, a more modern furnace over there, but they did not make it. Uh, Beckley Furnace shut down in 1919. Uh, 
And the number three furnace, which is now part of the Linden Odd Winery, shut down in 1923. And that was that was the last of it. All the other furnaces, those here in Salisbury and others uh, in adjacent New York and Massachusetts had shut down by then. So 1923 is, is the last hurrah here in Northwest Connecticut when number three shuts down in East Canaan. Nevertheless, there was enough pig iron in stock laying around on the on the lot so that they were selling it until 1925. And finally, the company was liquidated in 1927. So uh, that's really almost the end. And I say almost the end because the last shipment of iron uh, out of North, uh, East Canaan occurred in the fall of 1941, uh, some years after liquidation. 75 tons of salamanders were sold to the Feral Foundry in Torrington. Uh, and then they're broken up with modern equipment and carted off. The photo at the bottom is the salamander we have on display at Beckley. It's what happens when the masonry in the furnace fails and breaks through the, the, the walls. You get this big globule of iron. Now, this one is useless because it's full of bricks and charcoal and mortar. But not every, every salamander was like that. Some of them were virtually pure iron. And those are the ones that they, they hunted up and, and sold off in 1941. So the industry doesn't really end until 1941 with the, the sale of the salamanders. So there it is. Uh, now we have some interesting legacies. This is one where I near where I live in in Tacoma, Hammertown Road. Uh, the hammers are they didn't make hammers here. They used them. They used trip hammers to forge uh, sickle and side blades. And, and these days, you don't think too much of that. But in, in the 18th century, if you like to eat, you needed a side because that's how you cut your wheat. Mm -hmm. So uh, edge tools like this were important. The Harris Side Works uh, occupied the space on Hammertown Road. They had quite a complex of buildings. The Harris Company also operated in Pine Plains, and there's a Hammertown Road and a Hammertown Barn over there uh, that are for the same reason and the same company. So Hammertown Road is one legacy. This one we missed in the What's in the Name exhibit is Puddler's Lane, which is in Amesville, and that's where uh, the Puddlers, who are skilled artisans for Ratio Ames, lived on this road. Ames favored married workers with children because they are less often uh, drunkards and, and uh, otherwise dissipated lives. Single artisans tended to be a little bit more wild characters. So Ames very much encouraged his employees to be married and have families because they were definitely more stable. So Puddler's Lane was where all those guys lived. Um, I think. So we're going to switch gears here for the last few slides. Participation. The, the industry always had a diverse uh, workforce, which was kind of a surprise to me. I... I work with Bernie Drew on this, who's a historian in uh, Great Barrington. And I wanted to try and event, identify different ethnic groups. And we have uh, some wonderful preserved record books from the early days of the iron in East Canaan. And we were able to identify some ethnic groups. And I wondered, I work with Bernie because if you know Bernie, he's done a lot of uh, work on black history and W.E.B. Du Bois. And I said, Bernie, how am I going to find the black people? I, they had to have been here. How am I going to find them? And he gave me some clues. But the uh, the bookkeeper at the uh, Ironworks in East Canaan made it easy for me. <laughs> he put down Negro after the guy's name. So I, I didn't have to use any of Bernie's formula. To, yeah. to in a similar fashion, if the, uh, if the uh, supplier was an Indian, there was the word Indian came after that. So... We were able to identify French Huguenots uh, who uh, really were prominent here in uh, in Salisbury and, and nearby doing charcoal. Names like Bonotel, Rebelard, those, those are French people who came here to burn charcoal and stayed and, and really uh, made contributions to the local culture. We had Irish coming in as of the potato famine, famine and then we had Italians. At one time, Italians were persona non grata in North Canaan, and look at the phone book over there now. <laughs> so, uh, and we we did definitely identify free blacks who are selling charcoal to uh, uh, Samuel Forbes in East Canaan in 17, the 1790s, as well as Indians. The Stockbridge Indians particularly seem to have no trouble adapting to European culture. They, it's as if they kind of looked it over and said, 
oh yeah, let me see what you guys, we can do this. And they did things like make sure they had deeds to their land, they had lawyers. Uh, so they, they were willing to play along. Uh, I, I would not assert to you they were treated fairly in particular, but they played along with the Europeans and, and did quite well. And when they finally decided to leave the area, they sold their land uh, to the uh, European descendants. And we have been in contact with them. The Stockbridge Muncie tribe still exists, and, and we've had some dialogues with them. They're, they are fascinating, and I'm happy to say we've learned from them and they've learned from us. So uh, I'm hoping that relationship continues. So in any event, we had a, a pretty good ethnic mis mix in this industry. A 21st century concern of late is, is what about enslaved people, and we cannot find any record. There are there's certainly slavery in the Northwest corner. I'm not going to tell you there wasn't, but we cannot find any enslaved people working in the iron industry. We just can't identify anyone that's in that category. And we do know for sure there were free blacks. How do I know they're free? Because they had their own accounts in the book and they were paid money in their own name. If they were enslaved, that would not be the case. Well, same with the Indians. Uh, the big expansion, remember back a few slides ago, this industry really took off from 1830, 1840 onward. And because of the really strange laws that uh, Connecticut enacted with respect to slavery, in 1830, there were only 25 slaves in the state of Connecticut, and, and they weren't making iron in Salisbury. They were in Fairfield and New Haven County. So we can't now, uh, as you know, a group of students at Salisbury School really dug into this, and, and the, the closest association they could find was that it's, it's quite likely that Southern railroads used uh, Salisbury iron for various things involved in the cotton industry and, and other things that they did with enslaved people. But the connection is kind of a second order one. Mm -hmm. So uh, unless we uncover some more information, it looks like the story is going to stay pretty much this way, that the, the iron industry itself did not have any participation by enslaved people. Of course, the other 21st century question we get a lot, especially from uh, high school students and middle school students, is what about women? And we get into a wonderful discussion of how culture changes over time. And remember that in the in this era, there was considerable cultural resistance to having women do hard labor, although some of the things uh, colonial housewives did strike me as hard labor. I, I also can't figure carrying two kids around on my hips like women do still. Uh, so, But there was considerable industry to, or, or resistance to having them in industries and things like iron furnaces. But I make the following observation, the charcoal fuel furnace. The workers are working 12 hour days. They, they, the iron industry is not like the other industry at the time where you, the, the work week was five and a half days, you got it done at noon on Saturday. Well, the iron furnace is still running. It, it runs 24 seven, 365, a shift is 12 hours. You are not going to come home from 12 hours at an iron furnace and cook breakfast or cook dinner. It's not gonna happen. So who's fueling the guys, right? The answer is obvious, isn't it? The fuel that runs the guys that run the furnace is coming from the women. So uh, I, I get a little pompous here and say the women the women fueled the workers, but they did. Is that not a fair statement? And so uh, a lot of the girls go home with a big grin on their face when I show them this at the, the furnace, but it's the simple truth. So, okay, the aftermath. We have the curious legacy. I mean, we have Hammertown Road, and we also have uh, Publer's Lane, but we have the People's State Forest, the Great Mount Forest, uh, the Mount Riga Reservation, and, and several more because of all that timber that was put aside for charcoal wood. Isn't that cool? We've got all this open land because of the iron industry. Uh, now, I've got three shameless promotion pages. Uh, the Beckley Furnace Industrial Monument is on Lower Road in East Canaan. We do guided tours. I've changed this to Labor Day. We're having trouble managing to get to Columbus Day anymore. But uh, so you've missed this season. Or we're going to try maybe to be there next Saturday. Uh, but we do have tours. We have interpretive signs. It's a great place to go have lunch on a warm day. We have picnic tables. You can learn the furnace is there. There's signs. We do have water power. We have hydraulic turbines for you to look at. 
And if you, if you want a tour during the summer, we'll be happy to interpret the site for you. Another place you consider to put on your list is the Copake Ironworks uh, in Copake. Uh, they have a wonderful diorama of what their site looked at. Uh, we're, we're trying to match that at Beckley, but, and they've got a train. I mean, how can you resist it? <laughs> they, they built a, a, a train on the bed of the narrow gauge railroad that fed ingredients to the furnace. The interesting thing about Copake is they do not have the outside of their furnace. The outside wall was taken away during the depression and it left the innards of the furnace. So it's kind of a cutaway so it's, it's a good compliment to Beckley where we have it all. So you can see what the whole thing looked like. But over there, you can get a good view of what the, the inner workings and plumbing, there were water jackets and all kinds of interesting things interior to the system that you can go view that in Copay. So I definitely, and, and you can ride the train. Come on. <laughs> Shameless promotion, page two is more local to Salisbury Association. I have to measure the, the uh, mention the oral history. I mean, because if there is no one else. I'm going to be, again, pretty pompous. I will tell you there's probably no other place in North America that has 400, and Gene can correct me with the exact number, 428 or whatever. It's, yeah, all right. There's more. I felt pretty pretty good with more than 400 interviews in, in the database. It is an absolutely amazing archive and, and resource. It is well utilized by people all over the world. Uh, Exhibits, you just missed what's in the name. We're opening the new one on housing, as Rich mentioned earlier, but what's in the name will be back, uh, I think, at Noble. It's going to be at Noble. It's also going to be at Salisbury Central. So, so that one other, that one talks about, it's got things like, uh, you know, Hammer Town, but you can find out about Watcho Castanook Brook, which is just behind us here, and a lot of the other names in town. Uh, it will be at Noble in November. Okay. Uh, coming up, we're working on restoring the Holly Knife Collection, so that's going to be returning uh, probably in 2025, we're guessing. Uh, that's a collection of more than 200 knives made here in Lakeville by the Holly Company, and that'll be accompanied with some interpretive uh, panels that uh, explain some things about why are we making pocket knives for Victorian women? Isn't that an interesting topic? Uh, so look forward to that. And of course, we do this. We have joint operations with the library for talks. Lou just did a couple of walks in Amesville. And publications, if you really want to know more about this town, <laughs> stop into the academy and spin the rack around and pick a couple of books out of there. Gene put together a bunch of selections from the oral history. Uh, and so that way you can get a, a kind of an, uh, some of the more interesting events that are reported in there. Uh, there's an archive uh, or a, a kind of an autobiographical uh, book written by uh, Judge Warner, who grew up in the just before the Civil War in Salisbury. And he there's everything you want is in the the Warner book. There's hidden treasure chests. There's spooky things. There's ghosts. Uh, uh, there's houses people won't stay in, and that kind of, and, and then it's just plain, why do you have white picket fences in front of houses? He gives you an answer for that, too, So uh, in, in that era. So it's a wonderful snapshot of life in another time. Uh, the original story of Salisbury is in there in Julia Petit's book about the, uh, the, the founding of Salisbury, and Something a lot of people don't appreciate is in that era from the founding of Salisbury in 1741 until 1818, the church is very much part of the state, folks. If you are not in good standing with the congregational church, you are welcome to leave. <laughs> and so a lot of people don't appreciate that the constitutional concept of the separation of church and state was very foreign to New England culture. And it took a while for that to change. To this day, the town retains a very cordial relationship with the Congregational Church. And as, as those of you who live here in Salisbury know, we often have town meetings there. So uh, it's still very much a part of the community, but it was really part of the community in the 1700s. Uh, so uh, there's a whole bunch of other publications and picture books over there. So again, if you want to know, if you've recently moved here, or you want to just know more about the place you live, a lot of those books will help you in that context. I also, uh, let's see, Shameless Promotion, page three, is on the Great Mountain Forest. 
Uh, today you missed their open forest day, but it wasn't a really great day to be up there. You should check their website out. It is a wonderful resource for the public. They do forestry research, experimental plantings. The Yale Forestry School is located there. Uh, and they have a fabulous weather archive. If you're into doing your own climate research, they have a wonderful uh, re resource there in climate data that goes back decades uh, and lots of public events. They are working on a, it's a former charcoal bush. So this is again, land that came to us via the iron industry. And they're working on a new exhibit about charcoal. So mm -hmm. keep your eyes peeled. I'm sure they're gonna have a, uh, an opening to celebrate that. And these are some books. What I have decided to do is I had put together a, uh, a bibliography for my Taconic Learning Center course, and I'm, I'm going to make a PDF out of that and get it to the association so we can make it available to you. So don't be preoccupied with copying this down. The, 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 uh, the idea here is that there's lots of books that you can consult for more information. And those of you who are, who are here in the room today have, have a, a bonus. The Arsenal of the Revolution book here, uh, which was originally uh, inspired by the uh, Bicentennial, is available for attendees here in the room. And there'll be some at the, for those of you on Zoom, there'll be some available at the Academy, I'm sure. But if you'd like to have a copy of that, the association has provided them here at no cost. So you can take one home with you and you can read more about the canon story. Uh, so some of the others are Ed Kirby's Echoes of Iron, uh, if you want to know about the Ames works, there's a wonderful book about Connecticut's Ames Iron Works. It's out of print, but usually easily found on eBay or, or on Amazon. Uh, Bob Gordon's books on uh, American Iron. Uh, Bob is a retired professor from Yale who was an invaluable consultant to us uh, interested in the history of the area. Men of Iron is also mostly about Samuel Forbes and East Canaan. And, and the mining book is also interesting because it covers a little bit of the ironing and all of the other mining activity that went on. And uh, did you know they mined cobalt in Connecticut? And maybe they will again. And last but not least, Ed Kirby's uh, two really tour de force. Notice the, the, the Reader's Digest pictures here again. Uh, the making of the iron industrial age and industrial share, and especially if you have some interesting. In, in the industries in Sharon. Sharon was a very heavily industrialized uh, town as well. And the magnum opus here, the water powered industry of uh, what is it, the Upper Housatonic Valley. That's Bernie Drew's book. Bernie's a historian, Great Barrington, and uh, an incredible journalist. And that is a 780 page tour de force of all of the water powered industries in the Housatonic River. And it is, I hate, I point out to people, it's available at the book loft in Great Barrington. You do not sit down and read this book cover to cover. That, that's not the way you use this. What you do is pick it up and say, all right, yeah, let me go to 13 and see what happened in this part of the country. And it covers the, our corner as well. So uh, if you really want to understand the whole indus industrial past of this area, there's your source, and, and it's got years of entertainment in it for you. So, okay, that that brings us to the end. And I'm um, assuming what we'll do now is we, I guess we can entertain some questions from both the Zoom and the uh, room audience, but that takes care of the presentation. If somebody may need to go, and that's fine, but if Dick is going to be able to stay around, if you want to ask some, ask, ask some questions, please do. So yeah. today, if you don't minutes. want to listen to me anymore, go over to the academy. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Dick, you got a question back here? Right? Yeah. Right. Hey, Dick, you recall I'm sure in the three minutes goes down the tour where you and the guy are hurling to the back corner. When I was trying to get out of Mason, and I crossed his filial furnace. Yes. He claimed that he was in that furnace when it was operating, the one in our furnace. Yeah. And then he said at the end of the day, they would take a hot ingot and throw it into a trough of water, and that would heat up the water to wash up. Boy, I bet it would, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know, an ingot, when it's liquid, is at 2,800 degrees. So it probably hardens up and it's still around at 1,800 or two. You know, that's going to heat up quite a trough of water. Uh, that's another oral history. If you are interested in the iron, it's a Chilio Berti.
go read his oral history. It is fascinating. He was there. Do we have anything else? Other yeah. questions? Why did they put a furnace all the way up on top of Mount Wright? Uh, you know, it's water power. But, but you said it was naturally, the furnace there was naturally aspirated, right? Or... No, that one had uh, a bellows. Yeah, that was a cold blast furnace with a bellow. And it's kind of interesting the way the Mount Raga operation worked. I mean, it is true you had to lug everything up there, and there were three roads to do that. But what happened is that's the head of the, the headwater of Watcho Castano Creek, which is right outside the door here. And as that water comes falling, they made the uh, ingots at the furnace, and then they passed them down the hill to further and further processing all the way down here to town to Factory Street. There were forges and hammers and all that stuff all the way down. So it made a wonderful vertically integrated industry here, literally vertically integrated, where they brought the iron down from the furnace and processed it as they went down the mountain. And because every time the water falls another hundred feet, you can put a water wheel and get more. Oh yes, there are, yes. Especially if you go up in the early spring, you can see remnants of dams and foundations. In fact, I'm told there, there's a, the parts of a hell hammer out here next to the town hall. It's one of the trip hammers that was used on Mount Raga to form iron. And you can find the pad where that came from. I don't know where it is, but there are people who do. So you can actually find some of the foundations and locations of the various factories that came down the mountain. And literally every time you could build a new dam, you had more water power. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. About the when they melted the iron out of the ore, mm -hmm. I've seen pictures of the trenches they dig that's for correct. the iron to flow into called pig inside. Yes, that's correct. And so that iron is essentially cast iron. It is indeed. But I'm told that they take those bars and give them to be processed by blacksmiths. Yep. But when you try to hit a piece of cast iron, it breaks. That's right, it's brittle. So what you've got to do is you've got to process that so that you can turn it into raw iron. And the way they did that was that's what puddlers did. They would take the cast iron. Cast iron is about 4% carbon uh, by weight. It's got a lot of graphite in it. And the puddlers know how to get that out. And so now you can refine it into <clears throat> purer iron with less carbon content. Or you could take it over to uh, Colebrook and make steel, which is uh, the problem with making steel is a very paradoxical process. The way you make steel is first, this is what the Bessemer process does. First, you take all the carbon out of the iron and then you put back a specific amount. And, and the way they would do that, the way the Bessemer process does that is they put a lance into a ladle of molten iron and blow oxygen in there. And boy, does that burn the carbon out, let me tell you. And you can tell from the color of the flame and stuff when you accomplish that. Otherwise, you could burn up all the iron, too, if you don't know what you're doing. But they know how to burn the carbon out. And then they would show throw, it, depending on the label size, they throw 15 pounds of charcoal in there to put some known amount of carbon back in. What did the puddlers do? Uh, the puddlers... Uh, essentially, it's it's a process a lot like the uh, um, bloomery, where they take these things and heat them and beat them, and they work the carbon out that way. And, but I've tried. I've taken pieces of cast iron yeah. and heated it up and hit it, and it breaks off. Yeah, break, yeah. You got you got to know exactly what temperature to get it to, uh -huh. and they knew by the color and texture how to do that. And as you put all this stuff down, there, there's a wonderful description of artistry, I think it's in Bob Gordon's book, about how you do this. And it has to do with the uh, the texture and color of this stuff as you're reheating it and beating it. And you've got to know that. Uh, and if you look at a modern day metallurgical phase chart for iron, you can see what they were doing because what they're doing is they're moving along lines in that chart to change the composition of the iron. Now, they didn't know that but they knew how to get the result that they wanted from the colors and textures that they saw. And they had they had terms for this, like coming to nature. And uh, they had a, a, a very detailed knowledge of what you needed to do to turn that ball into what you wanted it to be. Uh, so that's how they did that. That's how you get 
uh, different kinds of iron from the basic cast iron product. And that's what Horatio Amos guys were doing over there in Falls Village. What do they use these big tubs for that we see? Those were usually used, oh, there's there a lot of different things. They, some of them are soap kettles, but a, a, a big use for those is you got them up to a boil and you, you put the hogs in there so that you could get, get the hog bristles off the hogs. Mm -hmm. So you would parboil the hogs in one of those big kettles mm -hmm. as part of the processing ritual. Mm -hmm. But they also use somewhat smaller ones to make soap. Uh, and there's probably a lot more uses that I don't know about. Mm -hmm. Well, wasn't one of them used just for a watering trough? Uh, well, you probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I was wondering, you said women were not welcome in the industry. What about children? Is there a documentation? Yes, there there were children. Uh, the children, uh, we have a wonderful picture of that. And I have to point out when I show that to audiences, in fact, it's not take your son to work day. Mm -hmm. uh, the kids work there, but it, it looks like they were primarily on non-school or after school. So they, they did not take the kids out of school as far as we know. Mm -hmm. And what the kids did was they brought pails of waters to, to the workers. They might have helped. They didn't stack pigs, but they could stack moles. Another thing we do know they did was they would climb the slag piles and look for little pieces of iron and bring back pails full of little, little dribbles and chunks of iron because they would throw those in the furnace mm -hmm. uh, to help things along sometimes. So the kids were there in, in, in uh, Lime Rock where the, the uh, foundry was, the kids could, could handle uh, you know buckets of sand and help pack the moles. That's something a kid could do. So we do know there were children involved. We, we don't really know the extent of it, mm -hmm. but it does not appear that they took them out of school, though. Uh, but I can't say they didn't either. Also, I had heard that in, and I don't know if it's true, in Fall Village, that they had like a worker community, I guess, and that they were forced to be dry. I'm. I, <laughs> well, that, that's, that's very plausible. Isn't it? One unique thing they did have in Lime Rock is that there was a. Uh, kind of a workers recreation center called the casino, which was built by the workers and the company. And the, the arrangement was the workers owned 51% share of the building. So it was a workers property and the company funded the other 49%. Uh, that building still exists. And so that was sort of the clubhouse. Uh, every scrap of information I've been able to get about, uh, you know, I told you about the practical joke the morale at the foundry in Lime Rock was apparently pretty high. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they did things, we have records of things they did that don't sound like 19th century practices. For example, they had a charitable contribution campaign mm -hmm. and especially management was expected to kick in. Uh, they, they provided a certain amount of medical assistance to employees. So, and they, you know, they were active in the community as well. And, most of the stories that have come down to us are show very high morale there. Uh, the workers enjoyed living there. there. There's a wonderful story about East Canaan and about uh, Mr. Barnum coming up. Uh, there was a recession and just before World War I, and they laid everybody off because Lower Road was piled high with pigs. And Barnum came up from Lime Rock and he told the superintendent, he says, I want you to call the men in and start making iron again. And, and the superintendent says, but, but Mr. Barnum, what are we going to do with it? We've got tons and tons of it stacked up here. He says, well, you know, the men stood by us when it got tough and it's time for us to give something back. He said, I don't really care if I have to borrow some money to meet payroll, but this economy is going to turn around. And, and, and I want these guys here uh, when that happens. And so they, they, need it, they need income, and I want to put them back to work. And he did that, and they made a lot of iron. Uh, the story is a little hard to believe about how much, but they made a lot of iron at $28 a ton. And when World War I broke out in Europe, the price of iron went to $65 a ton, mm -hmm. and they sold everything they had at $65. <laughs> So Barnum was right on the money. He knew the economy was not going to stay depressed forever, and he was willing to take a chance for the for his employees. Now, that does not sound like a, a, a an early 20th century tale, but 
uh, we do have enough documentation to show that that really did happen. Mm -hmm. And it certainly doesn't sound like a 21st century tale either, but mm -hmm. there's probably somebody somewhere like that out there. But <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful story. Uh, and, and another one I can tell you is that they made use of temp workers. And in this era, that was, uh, they called them hobos. Oh. And one of the interesting things that I never thought of that was brought out by uh, the superintendent's notebook was that these guys who worked in foundries, the hobos who traveled, they worked in every foundry in the United States. Mm -hmm. As a result, they knew every trick there was. Mm -hmm. uh, they had gotten an enormous education from going to foundry to foundry to foundry to foundry. And so when these guys came in, they always brought something with them in terms of knowledge. And one guy told Barnum in, in Landmark, he says, you know, if you need temp workers, just put the word out, go to the hobo jungle and put it out. And he says, if I hear about it, I'll, I'll start sending you people. And they did that. And, and the description in the notebook is priceless. I mean, some of these characters were really interesting looking sites walking up the road, mm -hmm. but they had the knowledge and they wouldn't stay long, but it sort of worked out. You needed a temporary worker for three or four months. Well, that's what these guys were willing to do. They'd stay one place for three or four months and then off they went. Well, that was just enough to get you through the pinch. And they brought in, in the case of Beckley, the, this guy knew a particular mixture of chemicals they could apply to the furnace that greatly extended the life of the fire brick. And they tried it out and it worked. And there were other tricks about how to set moles up and things that they learned in Lime Rock from these guys. So taking advantage of the temp workers in the hobo community really paid off for the company. And that you'd never expect that. And it's something BNR did. The photo with the practical joke, do you have any identification of the workers? Well, we have one name that might have been the guy that did the wheel carry. And uh, so I, I'm, if I ever become sure of that, we'll do that. But we do have some more information about the wheel carry stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, they also apparently had things like fake cut off fingers and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they had a the hunting club. Uh, in, in, uh, which is the predecessor of today's Hollenbeck Club down there. And they would bring city guys in and take them out on snipe hunts and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And we have records of that too. So there there was the usual kind of, you know, tomfoolery that went on in, in that era. Yeah. Have you contributed to the oral history? I have, yes. Yeah, mine's in there too. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? If not, then just thank you again. Wonderful. Thank you.